I expect you know all these things, but I would just review them a little bit for you to know that there is a command, it's sometimes put down as a request from our Lord and from Our Lady to consecrate Russia. Let us uh, be plain about this. First of all, I will quote from sources that have never been considered uh, dubious in any way about this request. You have, of course, Sister Lucy's memoirs and her letters in six languages or five languages in her own original handwriting in her letters, as well as in type transcript or rather typeset form of Portuguese, Spanish, English, French, and Italian. They've been published uh, and they've been acclaimed as scholarly works. You also have Fair Michelle, his 2000, vol 2000 page a three volume set, which again, no one has questioned his scholarship. In fact, Sochi in his book uh, congratulates him and dedicates his work and thanks him for his, his great scholarship. I'd just like to quote from a few places besides these to give you some sense of the request. So we're not dealing with a misunderstanding or maybe it's just something taken out of context. In the, the, his book, uh, Professor William Thomas Walsh, published in 1947, on page 226, he reports that Lucy, and this is a quote from him, Lucy made it plain that Our Lady did not ask for the consecration of the world to her Immaculate Heart. What she demanded specifically was the consecration of Russia. Again, page 226 of Walsh's book, Our Lady of Fatima. It's gone into over a million copies. It's been translated in various languages. In his book, Father Thomas McGlynn in 1949, on page 80, it's what he reports Sister Lucy was emphatic in correcting the consecration of the world. When he said, Our Lady asked for the consecration of the world, he said, no, Sister Lucy said, not the world, Russia, Russia. In the book, Pellegrinaggio della Mer Mervidia, published by the Italian Bishops Conference in 1960 in Rome, on page 440, Our Lady told Sister Lucy in 1952 in May, and this is what is the quote. Make it known to the Holy Father that I'm always awaiting the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart. Without the, consecration, without the consecration, Russia will not be able to convert, nor will the world have peace. Father Umberto Pasquale, a, a Salesian father, had known Sister Lucy since 1939. And up to 1982, he had received 157 letters from her. On May the 12th in 1982, Father Pasquale wrote in the Observatory of Mano that Our Lady never asked for the consecration of the world, but only of Russia. On August 5th, 1978, he asked her in person, quote, has Our Lady ever spoken to you about the consecration of the world to her Immaculate Heart? End of quote. And Sister Lucy replied, quote, no, Father Umberto, never. At the COVID era in 1917, Our Lady promised I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia. Father Umberto, wanting a written reply to his question, then wrote Sister Lucy's letter April 13th, 1980. And she wrote back, and I quote, in replying to your question, I will clarify, Our Lady of Fatima, in her request, only referred to the consecration of Russia. Father Emmanuel Roca, a native of Portugal, who was assigned translator for Professor Walsh for the interview noted above in 1946 which reported in his book in 1947. He reports a detail, that even makes it more clear that all of us are at risk if the consecration of Russia is not done in time. This is what Mr. Walsh thought that Sister Lucy did not understand the question. And so this is what Father Roca, his translator, writes, in, is written in another book, which is actually The Wonders She Performs, published in 1986 on page 160. Quote, but she, that is Sister Lucy, said more than once and with deliberate emphasis, what Our Lady wants is that the Pope and all the bishops in the world shall consecrate Russia to her Immaculate Heart on one special day. If this is done, she will convert Russia and there will be peace. If it is not done, the heirs of Russia will spread throughout every country in the world. Professor Walsh then replied, does this mean in your opinion, every country without exception will be overcome by communism? Sister Lucy, yes. 
While the Roka testifies that Mr. Walsh wanted to be positive about the answer, Sister Lucy, and repeated the question, adding, and does this mean the United States of America too? Sister Lucy again answered, yes. Why is it so important that it be the consecration of Russia? Why not something else? Why will nothing else work? Lucy herself was tired. If you think of 1936, in May of 1936, it was just two months before the Spanish Civil War. People could see that civil war was about to erupt. Anyway, people who had a little bit of sense. And so by May of 1936, her Spanish spiritual director is asking her, is it necessary to insist? And she answered, I don't know. Unlike the year before, she said, yes, insist. Shall I change anything? No. This year, she's tired of the question and she confesses her own limitations. She says, I don't know, but recently I was asking our Lord why he would not convert Russia, why he would not bring world peace except through that consecration. And Jesus answered by saying, and I quote, because I want my whole church to recognize that consecration as a triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, so that later on my church will extend the devotion to the Immaculate Heart and place the devotion beside devotion to my Sacred Heart. That is why God insists this is the way and the only way and nothing else will work. Now, if I could relive the last 34 years of my life over again and do something else, I might say, I wish there was another answer, but there isn't. This is the only way. This is the will of God and he's not changing his mind. The thoughts of his heart are to all generations as it says. And if you consider that our Lord's heart is not just a symbol, but actually is full of love. And of course, his greatest love is for his mother. She is greater than all the saints, and we've had some very great saints, but she is greater than all of them, and he loves her more, not just because she's his mother, but because she's the holiest creature that ever was made or ever will be made. And he wants her to be exalted. And so there we have, so what does this leave the church? There are those who hold that the church has no obligation, that it's simply a private revelation, and if the Pope wants to ignore it, he perfectly well can do so. And if the bishops want to ignore it, they can also perfectly well do so, and so can all the priests and everybody else if they want to. That is the theory, that is the thesis, that is the understanding of most people today. Unfortunately, it may lead millions of people into hell, that theory. It's a very dangerous theory, and it's completely wrong. How can we be so sure about that? We can base that on several things. First of all, before we get to the obligation to obey, let's get to the obligation to believe. Even in the course, philosophy as defined as being the study of final things in the light of reason alone without the benefit of revelation and the philosophy that deals with what we're obliged to do is called ethics in scholastic terms. Even by simple ethics, we can prove the obligation to believe Fatima, even without quoting scripture once. We will not stop there, but very simply, we have the obligation to believe our fellow man we could not, first of all, man has been made to live in community. That is, we live, we depend on each other. Some of us are good typists and others of us are good thinkers or writers or whatever else we do. None of us has enough talent and ability to live without the help of someone else. God made us that way. We are dependent on our fellow men. All of us are. We're dependent on them for different things, things that we're not good at. And so, even in the church, God has made us that way. Certainly the Pope and the bishops and the priests have gifts and authority that others do not have. Nevertheless, the Pope and the bishops and the priests also need the help of others. And that's the way God has intended it, that we live in community, that we depend upon each other, and that therefore, in order for us to live in community, we must first of all be able to believe a reasonable person when he tells us something reasonable, and we have no counter indication 
to think that there's something wrong with what he says. If we could not live in society, if we could not, if we weren't bound to believe our fellow man of goodwill, then we couldn't live in society. It's as fundamental as that. And so there is no real reason for not believing these 70,000 witnesses that they really saw this miracle. There's no real reason for not believing the, the approval of the seven popes of the message of Fatima as worthy of belief. There's no real reason for refusing to accept what the children told us. And so as such, we're bound to believe them just on the natural human level alone. We could develop that further. I, in fact, wrote a thesis for my years of philosophy on that basis alone. But there's much more than just philosophy or ethics to prove the obligation to believe. But I mention this, first of all, because there are those who think that, well, if it's not an article of faith, therefore I have no obligation to believe whatsoever. And that is a complete false conception of our obligation to live in this world. Everything is not revealed in the scriptures. But yet we have obligations that are taught, as St. Paul tells us in Romans, we have obligations which the natural law itself tells us. Now we do know that God has also reinforced the natural law by revealing much of it, if not all of it, in sacred scripture. But the fact is, we're also bound by the natural law itself whether or not it's in the Bible or whether it's in tradition. We are also bound by the natural law. And believing our fellow men is part of the natural law. We don't have to believe everybody all the time, but we do have to believe reasonably our fellow men. And that's an obligation. And it can be a serious obligation depending on what it is we either believe or don't believe from them. If it's something not important, there may be some slight sin in not believing them. But if it's something really important and we have no reason to doubt it, then to refuse to believe is also a sin, even on the natural level. The next thing is there's also a basis in scripture. We have various, first of all, passages in scripture which no one would dispute. And I think the first passage you'll find is in the book of the letter of St. Paul to Thessalonians chapter five, verse 19, the first, first letter to the Thessalonians, which he says, do not extinguish the spirit, do not despise prophecy, but test all things and hold fast to that which is good. So the first thing he says is, do not extinguish the spirit. The Holy Spirit can and does speak to every generation with prophetic messages. St. Thomas Aquinas, the greatest theologian, tells us that it's in second of the second part, question 186, add three, if I'm not mistaken. I can find it for you if I gave you the wrong numbers. That every generation receives prophecies from the Holy Spirit. And St. Paul, in his letter to the Thessalonians, tells us, do not extinguish prophecy. Do not extinguish the Holy Spirit. So if we can start off with the assumption that God can send a prophet and give us a message and we don't have to believe it, we're already going against scripture. Because that fundamental attitude is despising prophecy. It's extinguishing the Holy Spirit. And we are forbidden to do that in the Bible itself. That's not the only passage. You'll find, I think it's in Colossians, but I may have the wrong passage, but you'll find it, and it's a famous quote, that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Now those who interpret the word the prophets as being the prophets of the Old Testament, and it's not incorrect to believe that because certainly the prophets of the Old Testament have a lot to tell us even today. But there's another interpretation of that passage which means that the prophets of the New Testament that is, that the church is built upon the prophets of the New Testament. That we've learned that there is a hierarchy, and God certainly has made a hierarchy. There's the Pope and the bishops and the priests. As the Council of Trent defines, all three of them are members of the hierarchy, obviously in limited degrees and various degrees. But besides the hierarchy, there's also the charism or the gift of prophecy. 
And that charism also is what the church is built upon, not just the hierarchy. The church is built upon the, the, the charism or the a, a foundation of the apostles, but Christ Jesus himself, the chief cornerstone, built upon that is the apostles as well as the prophets. And in that analogy of built upon, if the foundation stone is what you're built upon, then the apostles are the next foundational stone, and after that are the prophets. So what is the relationship between the prophets of the New Testament and the apostles? And again, you go back to Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, and he tells us, he says, do not despise prophecy, do not extinguish the spirit, but test all things. So it's the role of the hierarchy to test the prophet, to see if the prophet indeed comes from God. Not all, not all people who claim to have the gift of prophecy are prophets. And that is why we don't promote apparitions which are not approved by the church, not because they all are ipso facto false, but we haven't got either the time or maybe the ability or both to actually examine everyone and test them. But the church has tested Fatima. The church has said that Fatima is worthy of belief. And that is why we promote and we say that Fatima has been tested. And then we have the command of God through St. Paul saying, hold fast to that. So God has told us, don't despise prophecy, test all things. It's the role of the hierarchy to test the prophet, in this case, Fatima. It's been found by the hierarchy to be good, and therefore we are bound to hold fast to it. And so for that matter is the Pope and the bishops to be bound to hold fast to it. So then are we trying to say, as some wags have said, that Sister Lucy, for example, is more important than the Pope or that she can command the Pope? And the answer is very simple. No, she does not command the Pope. Rather, God uses the prophet, in this case Lucy, to transmit a message. She transmits the message faithfully. The hierarchy is to judge whether this message comes from God or not. And having done so, the hierarchy is bound to obey, not the prophet, but God, whom they have determined has spoken through the prophet. And so all obedience is given to God. If we obey the policeman or we obey the Pope, if they have jurisdiction in this matter that they tell us to do things, then we're bound to obey. Not as obeying man, but as obeying God who speaks through or uses these persons to tell us what we must do. And so the hierarchy, that is the Pope and the bishops and the priests and everyone else, if I, if I leave out the lay people, it doesn't mean I say they don't have to obey. Of course they have to obey too. But it is a command of God for the consecration of Russia. When our Lord came in 1931 to Sister Lucy, it was two years and two months after the request, the formal request before the Most Blessed Trinity, commanding the consecration of Russia, commanding that the Pope command the bishops to consecrate Russia. Two years and two months later, he expresses his unhappiness. He gave them two years and two months as from June of 1929 to June of, to August of 31. Make it known to my ministers, given they follow the example of the King of France in delaying the execution of my command, like him, they will follow him into misfortune. Our Lord says that the King of France was punished. He was beheaded. He was killed as a criminal. Why? For one reason, because he did not obey in time to consecrate France to the Sacred Heart. Now, there may be those who say, well, that's too bad, he didn't know he had to obey, but he did have to obey. He was given a message to a saint. She wasn't canonized then, St. Margaret Mary. She certainly had a reputation in her lifetime as a saint. There was nothing contrary to the faith or morals in the message, nothing contrary to right reason for that matter. And although they could see that France, according to them, was in its glory days, that Leo, or rather Louis the Fourteenth, was the most powerful, and shall we say, the most glorious of the French kings in his power, and yet all those appearances were not real. 
And 100 years later, as we know, the French king was stripped of his power by the Masonic infiltration of his country and the lodges bringing about their taking away the king's right to rule, to make legislation, and, and causing the French Revolution. I think that historians would agree today it was all the work of masonry. It is interesting that our Lord makes that same reference that what happened to the kings of France by the same enemies will happen to the Pope and the bishops. Today, of course, they don't see it. But these signs are there if you're willing to look at them. But my point here is that our Lord himself says that they will be punished, that they will follow the king of France into misfortune for one reason, for not obeying this command. Obviously, he thinks that they're obliged to obey. Otherwise, it would be wrong for him to punish them for something they're not obliged to do. And when I say them, I think we're all included because at some point, we either haven't prayed enough or sacrificed enough or told our friends and neighbors or done what we could to make it understood. And if that's true for us, it's much more true for many others who falsify the message, who, who claim to be devoted to Our Lady of Fatima, knowing full well they're deceiving the people. And we have five examples of those, and we have booklets here to prove that there are people claiming to be devoted to Our Lady of Fatima who falsify the message, all the while bowing and, and, and saying pious things about Our Lady, all the time really being hypocritical about it. Whether they see that or not, God knows, but that's what they're doing. So this obligation then is based not only on the light of reason, it's also based on scripture. It's also based on, I would say, a further argument which I've given, which no one has answered me yet. And there are, there are theologians, whether conservative or liberal, whether left or right, who will disagree with what I've said. There are those who have even the reputation of being ultra conservative who think I'm wrong. And I was told this last year by one of the priests who didn't hold it himself, although there's another priest there, Father Murrah, I wish he were here today, who, dis who agrees with me that there is this serious obligation on the part of the Pope and the bishops. But the argument goes something like this, which I think that it was raised up in a question yesterday as well, that there are two kinds of revelation. There's either public revelation, which is close to the death of the last apostle, or there's private revelation, which you're not bound to believe. Well, as I pointed out, there are theologians today, among them Father Bishop Graber, who is a theologian in his own right, who has pointed out that these are not the only kinds of revelations. There's also public prophetic revelation that is not in scripture, not in the deposit of faith, but nevertheless is binding because it's not simply a private revelation. A private revelation, strictly speaking, is for a person, a private person. That is what a private revelation is. If you have a miracle of the sun before 70,000 people, if you have Our Lady telling her skeptics, if you don't believe us, come here on such and such a date at such and such a time, and I will prove to you that God is behind this message. She laid down the challenge, and all of us, first of all, have the obligation to seek the truth. We are told in the second letter of Thessalonians, chapter two, that the Antichrist comes because Catholics have lost the love for truth. It is a fundamental attitude to seek the truth, to love the truth, to defend the truth. And as such, we all have the obligation to seek the truth. Here we have a public prophetic revelation given to the whole world with these witnesses and people say, oh, I don't have to believe it, and close their mind and go about their business. Can that possibly be that they have no obligation just because I, they say, I refuse to look, I refuse to see, I refuse to know? That is not characterized by love for the truth. And the largest opponent to Fatima is, is exactly characterized by that. You have Father Danis, this Jesuit priest, who made a career out of his whole life of debunking Fatima by refusing to look at the evidence. And when he was offered the evidence, he refused to look at it. You see, in 1940s, during the Second World War, there were some people who took liberties with the text of Our Lady's message, the second part of the secret, 
and changed her words. And it was a big disservice. But they didn't want to, according to them, hurt the war effort. And therefore, they, did, they took out the word Russia when Ali said what Russia would spread her errors. Now, it was evident to a man like Dianes that something had been done to the text. So before the end of the war, one could say he did a service by pointing out that they've doctored the texts. But when the war was over, it was offered to him to come and read the original text, to come and interview Sister Lucy himself, and he refused. And yet he went on acting as if that this kind of, this kind of activity was still going on, when he himself refused to look at the evidence. He's not much better than the people who refuse to look at the evidence of Fatima. They say, well, you know, I don't have to believe it. Well, if you looked at the evidence, you would be forced to believe it. If you refuse to look at the evidence, you're not thereby off the hook because you don't look at the evidence. St. Thomas Aquinas proves in his the Summa Theologica that just because you keep yourself in ignorance is not an excuse for you being in ignorance. And your ignorance will not excuse you on judgment day because you refuse to learn the truth. He says, in fact, your guilt is greater because you refuse to learn the truth. And so this obligation is real. And I realize that there may be objections or questions raised, and I don't know, I can't anticipate all of them, but I'd be happy to try to answer your questions. And I'd be happy to debate anyone, and there are plenty of them out there who think that we're completely wrong in this. But this point is fundamental. This is the excuse that the church has been hiding behind for the last, I would say, 50 years for not doing the consecration, is they don't think they have the obligation. And it's so patently false. But I'd like to give another argument that has not been advanced. And I, don't I think that the arguments I've given are sufficient. I may need to fill them out for you to answer your questions. But this argument I'm going to give you, this line of reasoning I'm going to give you, I think is just as valid. And I don't think there's an answer to it. It's very simply this. Both Pope John Paul II and Paul VI, when they went to Fatima, every time they went, they came back to one verse in scripture. It was chapter 12, verse one of the Apocalypse. Behold, I saw a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and the crown of 12 stars on her head. It goes on, John, pa John Paul II, the last time he was there, in 2000 went on to explain not only chapter one, but chapter, chapter 12, verse one, but verse two and verse four. He went on to say that the message of Fatima is a divine warning to not follow the tale of the dragon that dragged down one third of the stars of heaven. That's chapter 12, verse four. I believe he was giving away to those who could decipher it, part of the third secret, one of the most frightening parts of the third secret. The tale of the dragon, of course, refers to the devil, and dragging down a third of the stars of heaven refers to dragging down the priests and bishops, one third of them, through the mud. How do we know that? You can read this in your own books of, of interpretation of scripture, I can refer you to a book by Father Bernard Kramer, 1956, in which he explains that the stars of heaven are the Catholic clergy. What is the connection between the stars of heaven and the Catholic clergy? And it's very simply this. A star, what is the purpose of a star in the old days? It was to navigate. You could use the stars to find your way to your port, to your place you were trying to travel to. All you needed was the stars and know how to read them and you could get to anywhere you wanted in the world. The stars of heaven in scripture refer to those instruments, those stars, those guidelines that God gives you on your way to heaven. And what are those guiding stars that show your way to heaven? But the Catholic priest and bishop. It says in scripture, the lips of the priest are to guard wisdom. God has given his priests to the people in order to teach them the way to heaven. But one third of those stars of heaven have been dragged down at the service of the devil. And that is what is said in scripture. And that is what John Paul said. It's a message for our time, telling us to 
to avoid the stars of heaven that have been working at the service of the devil, which refers to, I believe, above all, those who've been joined into masonry and who've put themselves deliberately at the service of the devil. Whether they recognize it or not, the 33rd degree of masonry is the service of worshiping the devil, and it's quite explicit. And there are a number of Catholic cardinals and bishops and priests who to this day belong to masonry, apparently one third of them. And so what we need to do is be able to distinguish. And our Lord says, by their fruits you shall know them. So by their fruits you shall know them. The Blessed Virgin's message is a solution to the crisis that we find ourselves in. That is, when the First World War was going on and Pope Benedict XV recognized that there was no way out, he had tried every way possible and he realized after three years of diplomatic attempts that there was no way to stop the war. That is why he appealed to Our Lady and he appealed to her publicly. He almost demanded her to solve the problem. And that was on the 5th of May, 1917. And she came back and said, she, she came back and on May 13th, eight days later. And she, over the next six months, explained the way, in fact, the only way to world peace. On July 13th, she said, only Our Lady of the Rosary can help you. Only Our Lady of the Rosary can help you. And October 13th, she said, I am the Lady of the Rosary. In other words, on July 13th, she was saying, only I can help you. Although the popes at that time asked for her help, she then gave a command to the pope to what to do to bring about world peace. And because his counselors from 1929 to the present think they know better than the Blessed Virgin, they're so convinced of it that they dare not even talk to people like me who have yet to be bested in an argument on this subject. Because they're so confident, but what have we got? We had World War I to make the world safe for democracy, or that was maybe World War II. World War I was the war to end all wars. And from there we go on to Korea, to Vietnam, to uh, Afghanistan, to Iran, and so forth. We now have a general in the United States military, the highest ranking general. He was the chief of staffs, General Petraeus, who says quite candidly in his book, or rather in the book, Obama's Wars, you can find it on page 330 and 331. I have a copy of it here if you want to read it in which he claims that we will not win this war, that we will go on in this war for another 50 years. In his own terminology, that this war will go on for the rest of our lives and the rest of our kids' lives, of our children's lives. They have no solution. There is no other solution offered anywhere. And yet we have people with the courage to say, We're not bound to even try Our Lady. We have millions of people dead, not counting the billion souls that have been killed by abortion in the last 20 years. And we still have people saying, we're not even bound to try? I find this boggles the mind that it costs them nothing to try. It costs no money, it costs no time, it's a five minute prayer. It's very simple to do, and they won't even try it. Can this possibly be without moral obligation? I find that impossible to believe. Our Lord says they will follow the King of France into misfortune for refusing to obey. I don't think that's that's severe compared to the price we're paying for refusing to even try it. But the argument I wish to leave you with is this, that how do we know that Our Lady of Fatima is actually not predicted in sacred scripture? There's a lot of things in sacred scripture that have not been examined. 
A lot of things in sacred scripture that have not been pronounced upon by the magisterium. It's quite conceivable, you don't have to believe it, but it's conceivable that Our Lady of Fatima's appearance is in fact predicted in sacred scripture. It could be predicted in chapter 12 of the Apocalypse. And it's possible that at some future date when they do the consecration finally, the Pope will pronounce on that passage and say, yes, Our Lady coming at Fatima is fulfilled, fulfilling this prophecy of sacred scripture. Now I posit this to you, I propose this to you, if that were the case, then it is part of the deposit of faith. We're not bound to believe it yet because it's not defined. But for those who understand it as being part of the deposit, they would be bound. It's not inconceivable that it's part of the deposit of faith. And as such, for someone to say you're not bound when it could be part of the deposit of faith, is being temerious to say the very least. I remember posing, proposing this to a professor here in Rome at the Marianum many years ago when he said you weren't bound to believe it. And I challenged him in class before all of them. And I said, can you say with certitude that it's not in the deposit, that it's not in the Bible, that it's not a prediction that yet to be realized for the future? And he said he cannot affirm that absolutely. Then I said you cannot affirm that you're not bound by it. Because if it's in the deposit of faith, and as St. Thomas tells us, especially theologians are bound much more than the average Catholic is to believe everything that he knows to be in Revelation. If you know, St. Thomas gives the example, it's in his question, I believe, on the faith. It'll be the first and the second part, questions, I think, 90 to 113. One of those passages there, it's been a few years since I read it, you will find he says that if you know that sacred scripture tells us that David had 70 sons, not 69, not 71, then you must believe that as an article of faith. We're bound by, to believe everything that God has taught. And if you know, as I believe some people do, as I believe Benedict knows when he says, he deceives himself who thinks that the prophetic mission of Fatima is concluded. He can see from the text they haven't given us. He can see from what's, he can see from the looking over the, the, the uh, landscape of the world. He can see what's coming. He says it's terrifying. And he knows it's true. He is no longer eluded, but there are people in the church who are. He says they are deceiving themselves. Those who know it and refuse to believe it deceive themselves. To deceive yourself is, in a serious matter, a moral sin. We must love the truth. And that's what John Pope Benedict said last year before 500,000 people. He deceives himself. He didn't say he's mistaken. No, he deceives himself. It's that clear. And so we have that obligation to believe what we know to be the truth. Whether it's by virtue of the faith as defined, as defined or what's in the Bible as we know to be true or what, we, what, or what we have simply on the good word of somebody else who's a reliable witness, we're still bound to believe the truth. We're still bound to seek the truth and we're still bound to defend the truth. Even if it's uncomfortable even if it costs something in our personal social relations or in our salary or, in, or, or people respecting us, we still must defend the truth and stand by the truth. And when it comes then to establish that the message of Fatima is true, it also comes that we're bound to obey it. And we're bound to obey it as a basis of a serious obligation. And this is what has been, I think Isaiah talks about these false prophets who sow cushions under the elbows of people with duties to do. That they're the sowers of cushions, make life easy for them. Oh, that's okay, Holy Father, you don't have to do it. You're not obliged. These are the people, the painters of lies who cause it so that we all suffer while they have a cushy position who have not examined themselves and say, oh, 
I'm an, I have a doctorate in theology, or I'm a smart man, or I wouldn't say, I wouldn't mislead you, etc. I challenge any one of them to take up the thesis and say it so publicly, and let us deal with it out in the open where everyone can see what the arguments are. Up to now, there have been no takers of this challenge. I've said it already in my book, not, I didn't write the book, but in the second part of this book, I wrote book two of this, and I pointed out that there's this obligation that is binding on a serious obligation. This book came out in 1997. It's 14 years since I published this. There's not been one serious argument against it, except uh, some sort of uh, saying, who does he think he is? Well, I have spent 12 years in university. I have done some studies. And I did learn something here in Rome when I did my studies. And I've yet to find someone, at least I had the professor in Rome, when I challenged him to recognize the limits of his own knowledge. And it's here. And it's serious. It's an obligation that is binding. And I've yet to find anyone to find, to tell me why I'm wrong in this. And there are three bases for this. One is simply right reason. The second one is sacred scripture. In as plain as St. Augustine tells us to interpret scripture in its literal sense, unless it's against faith and morals. I have pointed out both uh, the letter to the Thessalonians and, and have much more than this talk, various passages in scripture. But finally, the third argument, which answers all of them, which says they cannot, confer, they cannot affirm it's not in scripture. And they can't. The only way they could do that is to have themselves a definition from the Holy Father. In fact, this brings us back to this point I made yesterday, which is, you might think I'm extreme. You might think I'm wrong. You have a right to ask the Holy Father for a ruling. You have a right by virtue of your baptism. It is defined in the Second Council of Leon in 1274 that in matters pertaining to ecclesiastical jurisdiction, every baptized Catholic has a right to seek a ruling from the Pope. If anything is in the jurisdiction, ecclesiastical jurisdiction, certainly the message of Fatima is, and you have a right to seek a ruling, not an opinion. The Pope may have an opinion. We all have opinions. You have a right to seek a ruling. That is a juridical ruling. You know, the difference between a ruling and an opinion is as follows. If a man is on trial for his life, and the judge hearing the trial, the case, is asked by his wife privately at dinner one day during the trial, is the man innocent or guilty? The judge can give his opinion, his private opinion, to his wife and say, he's guilty. But that private opinion has no juridical standing. It's his opinion of what he sees at the time of, uh, as far as he knows, as what's going on. That opinion is not what we're looking for. We're looking for a juridical ruling. That is something that, that the Pope takes responsibility for. We see the distinction, they understand this distinction, both John 23rd and Paul VI very clearly stated that they refuse to make a ruling. John 23rd, when he read the third secret on August 17th, 1959. The text they haven't shown us yet. The other text he read in 1960. Just as Paul, Paul VI, when he read the text in question on the 27th of June, 1963. Not the text he read on the 27th of May, March, 1965. In both cases, both popes said very simply, I refuse to make a ruling. I refuse to judge whether this is true or false. I leave that to my successor. Both popes have refused, and to this day, including Pope Benedict, he has refused to make a public ruling on that text. You have a right to ask him to make a ruling. You haven't got a right to command him, but you certainly have a right to ask him. He is the pope, we can't command him, but we can ask for a ruling and you have the right to ask for such a ruling. It's defined not only in the Council of Lyon, 1274, but again in 1870 in the Second, First Vatican Council. 
that in matters pertaining to ecclesiastical jurisdiction, you have a right to seek a ruling from the Pope. By one person doing this, maybe it won't have much impact. Even by 10 or 100, and by one priest doing it, it wouldn't have much more impact than one layperson. But 10 or 100, even more if bishops asked for a ruling. And I think that you know, when, when a priest is appointed parish priest or a bishop is appointed in charge of a diocese, you read this in the lives of the saints, they don't want to take this jurisdiction on. They don't want this responsibility. Just yesterday we had the, the life of, uh, presented before us of Saint Antoninus, Saint Anthony, little Anthony of Florence, who was a theologian of the Council of Florence. But they accepted when the Pope gave them, insisted that they take the commission. But in taking that commission, the parish priest and much more the bishop has the right to say, Your Holiness, you gave me the job, you insist that I take care of this diocese, but now you have to give me the tools. You have to give me what I need in order to take care of the souls in my care. I can give you an example from the Second World War that the commanding American admiral in Hawaii was not told that the, the moment of the attack from Japan was set for December 7th. The Americans had already broken the code and knew the day and the time of the attack. Yet the President of the United States refused to tell the Admiral in, char Admiral in charge. Now this is related by, after the fact, by admirals and generals in, in writing. I'm not making this up. But as the Commander in Chief of the United States Army, he had the obligation to tell the commanding officer on base what to do and what was going to happen, but he didn't. I think there's somewhat of a parallel here in the third secret that the commanders in the field of each diocese, the bishops in charge of their diocese, they need to have this information, this intelligence that is coming from heaven to tell them how to save the souls in their charge. And it's been not given to them. And as a result, they're like that admiral in Hawaii in Pearl Harbor when he lost so many men. He even had his planes turned inward so they couldn't take off and so forth. And yet the second in command knew all the time. There you have the Secretary of State has determined in his own mind that this other text is not authentic. We have his own word for it pretty well in public television on Porta Porta in, 19, in 2007, on May 31st. When it was proposed to Arch Cardinal Bertoni that maybe there's this other text that talks about apostasy in the church, that it starts from the top. His answer was, it cannot be. It cannot be because is not the Blessed Virgin Mary the help of Christians? Is she not the mother of the church? How could she possibly say such a thing about the Vatican and about this apostasy starting from there? That a priori argument is not an argument at all. We are told in scripture that an apostasy will come. In the message of Fatima, it's told by Cardinal Chappie, he tells us that it comes from the top. We have in the magazine, you can see the testimony of a priest who received it from the lips of Cardinal Ratzinger himself, that the third secret talks about the second Vatican council. It's in the secret. You can deduce this from, and it's also said by the same priest, it talks about the change in the liturgy from the old mass to the new mass. It's in the third secret. You can deduce that same thing from what Pius XII said, that the words of Lucy is a warning against the suicide. That is the act of killing themselves, the spiritual act of suicide, of killing the church, by changing her faith in liturgy, her theology, and her soul. There you have Pius XII telling you what the third secret is. It's all there, and I would urge you to read it in its reasoning and in the testimony, and it gives you the, re the references where to find the primary documents. 
in the book that's now out in English and Italian, The Devil's Final Battle, the latest edition. Devil's Final Battle came out last year, a new edition of it, and just today, The Devil's Final Battle in Italian, the same book, and explains what's in the secret, and knowing the content of the secret tells you why they have not explained it, and why they've not revealed it. But as priests in charge of parishes, as bishops in charge of dioceses, you have a right to this intelligence. You have a right to ask for it. I believe you have the obligation to ask for it. If they don't give it to you, at least you can say on, to God on Judgment Day, I asked for it, they wouldn't give it to me, so I did the best I could with the information I had. But if you don't ask for it, when you know it's there, then in part, it's your own responsibility for not getting it. But back to this whole point that the obligation to believe and to obey is based both on reason, on sacred scripture, and on the fact that Fatima, fact, it's not an established fact, you don't have to believe it, that Fatima is of such magnitude. It is the fulfillment of biblical prophecy when you see that we've had 14,400 wars in 6,000 years of history, recorded history, and yet Our Lady Fatima promises to stop that. The only place that's as predicted besides Fatima is in sacred scripture. When we're told that they'll learn the art of war no more. That has not happened from the time that Isaiah and Micaiah made these prophecies to the present day. Our Lady says that time is now. The significance of Fatima is a milestone in human history beyond anything. It's much more important than the Council or World War II or anything else other than the life of Christ himself. It is a milestone in the history of mankind. And this generation has not recognized it. And we will pay the price for it, not just the Pope and the bishops. But it's up to each of us to do our part, to make it known, to make it understood, and to live. And even though it looks like a little small thing by praying your five decades of the rosary or wearing the scapular, our lady held up the scapular for all of us to wear the scapular, even though these things look very small, these things are very great in God's eyes. And doing what we can and what, we, what God gives us out of hand, that is all he asks us to do. But he also asks us to understand these things and be able to explain them to others who have more importance. As St. Augustine said, being a Christian, I rejoice with you. Being a bishop, I tremble. The responsibility I have is much greater. And he very much appreciates the help that he would get from priests or lay people helping him to fulfill his job. I'm sure all good bishops would feel the same way. And I, if this is not clear enough, as it may not be, I'll be happy to try to explain this better or answer your objections or get back to you with an answer in writing to whatever objection I cannot answer right away. God bless you and thank you.